Hey, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but I've got a secret. I mean, I, I shouldn't be. When a person says they have a secret, I could see it on your face. Is he going to tell us? You know, everybody kind of leans in because we want to be in the know. I mean, I had a friend that used to say, say he said, I probably shouldn't be telling you this. And I'm going, I'm going, well, then don't. And then I'm going, but maybe he will. <laughs> we kind of want to know. We want to know a secret, like it's going to be a big thing. We want to be in the know. Yeah, probably shouldn't tell makes you want to know more. Because that's what a secret is. It's an unknown. And we, we tend to think that it's something important. We think it's something of value. We ask someone, you know, how are you such a good cook? What, what's, your, what's your secret to that casserole that you make so well? Or, or, or we say, what's your secret to making money? You can get articles every day on the secret to making money. You know, how about that quarterback? He always seems to come through in the clutch. What's your secret? Here's one. After 65 years of marriage, a grandpa still calls grandma honey and sweetie and baby and sugar. And so he was asked to tell a secret to how to keep love alive for so long. He said, I forgot her name 10 years ago and I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> when, we, when we lived in Houston, we uh, were just starting our family and in the subdivision next to us, there was a, a piney woods. And at the time we had... I believe we had, we had two kids, uh, two boys, and so they would love to go out to those piney woods, and we called them the big secret. I mean, we had a club. We had names. I was, I was uh, Big Daddy Mike, and then one of our sons was Brother Mike, and the other one was Fat Boy. And so we would go out there in our little club to the big secret, and they loved it. And we would be walking up there. I'd say, there might be something behind that tree. I don't know, let's, let's go over here. And I mean, I had them going. It was just an illusion, but they really, they loved it. And that, that became so important to them, being able to go out to the big secret. Well, why was it so, why was it so important? It was important because it was something interesting. It was something more. It was the big secret. Well, today's passage is about a big secret, a real secret a captivating, encouraging, life-altering secret. And the first verse of this chapter kind of gets us into it. I'll encourage you to have your, your Bibles open. Leave them open to page 1,820 to chapter 3 because we're going to be referring to this passage a fair amount as we learn about just what this big secret is. And it starts out by him saying, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. There's a reason that Paul is a prisoner. There's a secret to why he is in prison. And then in verse 13, so that's verse 1, verse 13, he kind of ends it so you get the idea of what he's talking about in this passage. He says, don't be discouraged about my suffering for you. So he says, I'm in prison. Don't be discouraged that I'm suffering in prison. Normal life can be discouraging. Sometimes we can feel like we're living in a prison. We have our own prison, sometimes of our own making, sometimes because of circumstances, sometimes just through the normal course of life. And we can go through times where we are discouraged, discouraged, and we are in need to be encouraged. And that is what he's doing in this passage. Why does God allow bad things to happen? Send Paul, of all people, to prison. It's a mystery. Sometimes it's hard to mesh together the love of God with the hard parts of life that happen. It's a mystery. Doesn't always make sense in the moment. And now as the apostles tell the Ephesians, don't be discouraged. <clears throat> Instead, be encouraged because, he says, there's a marvelous reason that I am in prison. I have a secret. The passage calls it a mystery. If you look at the word mystery, is used several times, and that word simply means a secret. More specifically, it's called a mystery because God, like any mystery, you know, it's you know some facts, but you know there's more coming, and it just hadn't been revealed, and that's what he's saying. I am in prison because of the mystery of God, that there's some things we know, and there's some things that God is doing, but we don't know the full picture yet, but there's a glorious ending to it. 
It's a mystery. Mystery is like that big secret. Parts yet to be revealed. So what is it? What is, what is this mystery that's so encouraging that a person can rejoice even when they're trapped in prison? It's this. God in his grace has placed his favor on a people. He is calling and he is keeping his church. He's calling people to come to Christ. And as people respond to Christ, they are member of his body. And God has chosen and is presently working in and through his church. And that's no small thing. When Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, which is near the church in Ephesus, all kind of in that uh, area in western Turkey, he says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glorious mystery. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. If you're a Christian, you are part of this glorious mystery that Paul would go to prison for in a second because it's that big a deal. The great hope of the glorious plan of God. Don't be discouraged about being in prison, Paul says. It is so worth it because God, in this, he said, he is with us like never before. He was with the Jews. Now he is with the Gentiles. Now he's raising up a church in the Greek world of Ephesus. God is with us. And that's a wonderful thing. And then what he does is he breaks down what that looks like. And that's what I want to do is there's four words I would like to use to describe what this mystery is that Paul, what this big secret is that Paul is talking about. And the first word is found in verse three. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. That's the word revelation. Theologians talk about revelation. What does that mean? God's revealing himself. God is communicating something about himself to us. He's done that ever since before the beginning of time. It says that he spoke the world into being. He communicated the world into being. He said, let there be light. Let there be land. Let there be animals. Let there be people. God's word is active. And all mankind can get an idea of what God's word is like, by just, what God is like just by looking around. I mean, the way things are set up, the order of things, the beauty of things, even, even small things like the way the earth is positioned, the tilt in the atmosphere, not to mention the fascinating ways that our bodies are designed to work. Or that love or a sense of right and wrong that sometimes might be twisted, but at least everybody has that. Or the, the nature of relationships and the need for them. They all bear the imprint of a maker. God spoke it into being. I was talking to someone the other day. When you look around at the design of the world, you can't help but go to the fact that there must be a designer. You would literally have to choose to disbelieve that there's a designer behind the design of this world. And that is God who spoke it into being. But he didn't stop there. He spoke in various ways through the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles that's mentioned in this passage. And he revealed himself in another way. He revealed himself 2,000 years ago when he became flesh and came to earth in the God-man, Jesus Christ, in the life that Jesus led, in the miracles he performed, in his, his uh, uh, death on the cross, in his resurrection, he's more than just a beer man. The Bible says the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. That's God's revelation. And then specifically, God, Paul is saying, and he revealed himself to me. And if you know the story in the book of Acts, Paul, who was a model Jew, who as his duty is trying to rid, uh, rid the world of this, this Jesus sect. And as he was going down the road to Damascus, there was a blinding light and an audible voice that spoke to him. And that was Jesus who revealed himself to Paul. That was a revelation. It wasn't just a secret that Paul figured out that made him convert to becoming a Christian. It was that Jesus met him and revealed himself to him. I mean, he was looking for Christians to persecute them, not to become one himself. And he had quite a reputation. But God had found him and Jesus was revealed to Paul by his grace. 
God went from persecuting Christians, uh, Paul went from persecuting Christians to actually becoming a Christian. And now God's revelation, it's all, I'm getting all this out of this one word. God's revelation has been given to the church. Maybe not in a blinding light, but in a written, lasting testament called the Word of God. Just as God's Word was active in creating, just as uh, God was active in the wilderness and other places throughout the Old Testament, just as He was active in coming to earth, condescending to become man in Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Hebrews, the Word of God is living and active. That it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, the joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what this book does. It's a glorious mystery. It's far more than being, the, it's the number one selling book of all time. But it's way more than that. It's an amazing document. And the reason is, is because it's the Word of God. We don't understand it all. Sometimes we might seem like we can't figure it out. Sometimes it even seems contradictory. But it's God's mind written down. And it's enough for us. It's a glorious mystery that God has chosen to communicate for his good pleasure through men in creating this document from all walks of life. You know, kings and prophets and priests and fishermen and tax collectors, doctors, Written over, what, 1,500 years? 66 books? And, and somehow together in all that, they, they, they combine to, to create, to, to give us a unified message because it's inspired by one author. That's God himself. Revealed to us by his Holy Spirit. So Paul says, this has been given to me by revelation. That's what all this is about. So we can certainly be encouraged because if we're a believer in Christ, it means we're caught up in God's great plan and we share fully in all of his promises. That's quite a big secret. So that's the first word. The word is revelation. The second word is found in verse 10. And this is a, this is a, this is a crazy thing. The verse says that his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to who? The rulers and authorities in heaven, according to his eternal purpose that he set in Jesus Christ. What in the world is he talking about? The word is magnitude. If you ever look through a kaleidoscope, you know, it's got a... It's got those little colored stones and it's got some glass panes and it's got some mirrors and when you turn it, you reflect it and you create all kind of shapes and colors and it's really kind of a, kind of a cool thing. But when it talks about the manifold wisdom of God, what it's talking about is that God's plan and purpose in relation to the church, that's you and me, as being beautiful, like that kaleidoscope, as being multifaceted. That's what he means when he says the manifold wisdom of God. Now watch this. It uses the phrase, the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now most commentators, and I tend to agree, says what, you know, you ask, what is, what, what is he talking about? He's talking about angels. He's talking about heavenly beings. It's a supernatural thing. Did you know that angels are watching us? It's in here. Angels are watching us right now. Good angels and bad angels. And the good angels are, are, are rejoicing, the Bible says, when a person comes to Christ. So they have to be watching. 1 Corinthians 4 mentions that the angels watch, along with the rest of the world, what God is doing with the church. Now, why do they do that? Well, it's a supernatural thing. What this idea is, that's why I'm using the word magnitude, is that somewhere in the heavenly dimension, which is much closer, we often think it's out there somewhere. It's much closer than we think. It's a pretty big deal. Real heavenly beings are peering into this physical realm to learn about God and Almighty, to learn about his plan and purpose. They're learning about God by watching us, by watching what God is doing in the world. And what do they do when they learn something new about God? 
they go back and praise him. It helps them praise him because of what God is doing in and through the church. What an amazing thing. Now, does this mean that the angels are pondering Paul's conversion that he talks about in this in, in the book of Acts and um, uh, that we learn in the book of Acts? Does, does, does this mean, yes, that they're rejoicing whenever a person comes to Christ? There's some kind of connection there. They, are, they, are they pondering what it means that in this, in this passage, it's talking about how Jews and Gentiles both have access to the throne of God through belief in Jesus Christ? Are they watching the church to see how the church in the world over the centuries waxes and wanes and waxes and wanes, trying to get their arms around the depth of the wisdom and the riches in the knowledge of God, as Paul mentions in his doxology in Romans 11, so they can offer praise to the glory of God. John MacArthur describes it this way. He says, in the class, he says, in the classroom of God's universe, he's the teacher, the angels are the students, the church is the illustration and the subject of the manifold wisdom of God. That's us. It's no small thing. Whatever Paul meant by the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, his overall intention is clear. He wants us to understand something, that the magnitude, that in Jesus Christ something big is happening. It is so big that it's, it's larger than time and space, and we are a part of it. Just like the church he's writing to in Ephesus. What happened in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the eternal purpose it says that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So whatever happens to us, whatever happens to the, to the church over the centuries, the universal church around the world is not just an appendage to history. What he's saying in this passage is that it is front and center on, not only on this planet, But in the supernatural realms, God is calling a people to himself. And there's there's quite an interest in heaven over all of it, over us. That's quite a big secret. The magnitude of the big secret. Third one, found in verse 11 and 12. The word is access. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach with freedom and confidence. We may approach the throne of God with freedom and confidence because of what Jesus Christ did. You probably know back in the day before Christ, it was a great privilege and responsibility to be chosen by God to be a priest in the temple because priests were like, they're like mediators. They stood in the gap. They were God's representative to man and they were man's representative to God. And then as I mentioned last week, in the center of the temple, there was the Holy of Holies, which which represented the most intimate place of God. It was a a big secret. It was truly a mystery. The high priest could only enter once a year. And they tied a rope around his ankle because if he messed up and God chose to kill him, they could pull him out without having to go in there. It was a big deal. But something happened when Jesus died. The veil... That thick veil that separated the, the, the central most presence of God with the rest of it was ripped in two by Jesus Christ. God did that. We don't need an earthly priest anymore. Jesus is our high priest. He made the full and final sacrifice. He was not only the priest, he was also the sacrifice. He's broken down that barrier. And what had only been available to the high priest once a year is now available to all of us. We have equal access into the presence of God. And he promises his presence with us. That's a big deal. That's a big secret. Apostle Peter is writing to the church. And Peter says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. What an amazing mystery. God of the universe has granted access into his very throne room of God. We're his father. Uh, He is our father and we are his children. Jesus is our high priest and his arms, picture them on the cross, they're wide open. As if he's saying, come to me. You're all invited. This big secret called the gospel is increasing. And it's the revelation of God who invites us all into his presence. 
and all that comes with that. Then the final one. The passage uses the word administration, verse 2. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That's, that's Paul saying administration, the word is stewardship. When we lived in Houston, we lived on the north side of town, and there's an airport nearby, and at the airport was a hangar. And somehow I got connected with this business group who rented the hangar to house the production, the assembly line of uh, an airplane, an acrobatic airplane. It's called the Satabra. And somehow I got connected to them. And they gave me a key. And the reason they gave me the key is they wanted me to be the caretaker. They wanted me to watch over the place and make sure everything was okay and nobody was breaking in and stealing. And also, I think they're trying to sell it. Whenever someone came by that was interested in it, I was, had the key so I would, I would show them the property. With the key, they had given me the stewardship of that place. A stewardship is a responsibility given by God to take care of something. And Paul is saying, I've been given this stewardship, and we've been given that stewardship as well. It's no small thing. The full impact of this grace of God found in Christ, it had such an impact on him that he wrote to the Philippians, and he said, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. And as Paul was entrusted with the revelation of God, so are we as his church. We've been given this stewardship. We are caretakers. And we live it out in our strength, in his strength, in his strength, in whatever context we're in. So do we, do we fully grasp the, 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 the depth and the height and the length and the breadth of this great mystery that Paul is talking about? We're in it. We are part of it. Elida such a great privilege, the Apostle Paul tells his friends in this first church of Ephesus not to lose heart, not to be discouraged. And when we get discouraged, remember this big secret, this marvelous place that we have in Christ. He is our hope. He is our glory. He made it that way. And in and through every circumstance that we face as his children, the mystery called life, God is at work by means of his goodness and his blessing for his glory. The big secret is the mystery of the gospel. And we've been placed in the promises of the glory of God. And we have a big part to play. God has given us that and given us the power to accomplish it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this big secret. Lord, it's so easy to get caught up in our lives and we think more about things that are going to pass away even that day. And if they don't, they're going to pass away in eternity. And yet you have given us something that's not going to pass away and something that can't be taken from us because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, I pray that we might be able to grow even more in appreciation of this thing called the good news of the gospel so that we might, uh, we might be encouraged, so that we might have joy, and so we might be bold witnesses. For it's in your son's name we ask these things for his glory. Amen.